Welcome to Between the Lines, a podcast. I'm Janine. And I'm Jess. And we both work at the Winkler branch of South Central Regional Library. And in this podcast, we talk about books with our own twist. Uh, We'll talk about the first half of the book and predict where it might be going. And then finish reading the book and discuss the second half. There will be snark. There will be spoilers. Depending on the book, uh, there may be references to violence, sex, or other adult topics. So if that's not for you, stop listening now. And all right, we'll get into this week's book. All right, so today we are diving into the book The Pawn by Stephen James. Special Agent Patrick Bowers had only met one man who made him truly afraid, until now. When he's called to North Carolina to consult on the case of an area serial killer, he finds himself in a deadly game. Cunning and lethal, the killer is always one step ahead of the law, and he's about to strike again. It will take all of Bowers' instincts and training to stop this man who calls himself the illusionist. And just when the pieces start to come together, Bowers realizes they're not quite adding up. Can he unravel the pattern and save the next victim? Or will the illusionist win the game by taking one of his opponent's pieces? Thrilling, chilling, and impossible to put down, the pawn will hold suspense lovers in its iron grip until the very last page. This is book one in the Patrick Bowers Files series. There are eight books in the series in total, including book zero, Opening Moves, book two, The Rook, book three, The Knight, book four, The Bishop, book five, The Queen, book six, The King, and book seven, Checkmate. According to Goodreads, there's also a prequel series called The Bowers Files, The New York Years, featuring the same character. These books take place prior to the events in The Pawn. Stephen James is a nationally best-selling author whose award-winning novels continue to gain wide critical acclaim and a growing fan base. Best known for his psychological thrillers, he has received dozens of honors and awards for his books, including four Christie Awards. His novel Every Wicked Man won the 2018 International mm. Book Award for Best Mystery Suspense. Equipped with a unique master's degree in storytelling, Stephen has taught writing and storytelling on four continents over the past two decades, speaking more than 2,000 times at events spanning the globe. So, I know I have a lot of thoughts about this book. And I think you do too. Yes. I Um, mean, first off, I hate the cover. The cover is, yeah. Boring, predictable, but uses an awful color of yellow. Yes. Also, this book is not a new book. No, it's what, 2008? I can't remember the exact year, but yeah. And uh, we should also mention that this is inspirational fiction. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you caught that from anything that I just said. Uh, Aside from the Christie Award, which I believe is... I was actually going to double check and make sure it was Christian fiction. Well, yeah, that's how we have it cataloged anyways. It's not... um, Right off the bat, I will say, so far it's not overly Christian. Well, I made notes. (laughs) (laughs) And it takes till chapter 25 before there was any mention of God. Yeah. And that's mainly him telling off a pastor who's being uh, not very nice when his (laughs) wife is dying. Yeah. And so, I mean, as far as the rest of the book goes, it's clean. It's clean reading, I would say. Like, Um, I mean, okay. It's gory. It's gory, but it's not like there's not swearing. No. There's no no language. There's no, like, sexual no stuff really happening um yes i mean it is a a thriller it is a book about a serial killer so something to keep in mind like the prologue is literally (laughs) a guy committing suicide with his girlfriend but then she commits suicide and he leaves well he helps her he he tricked her into committing suicide it was supposed to be a not a murder suicide uh a suicide pact yeah yeah type of deal and yeah, I, my initial thought was, well, that started off with a bang. <laughs> yeah, like it, <laughs> it's just right into it. It's pretty, it, it's quite the start for a Christian fiction book, mm-hmm. put it that way. But then I was also like, well, is this the guy? Is this the serial killer? Do we know right now? Like, well, that's the thing. Like, it starts off, it gives his name, it gives I know. who he's killed. And I was killed. Like, like, he can't, this can't be it yet. There's, there has to, no. Well, his name is what? Aaron? Aaron Jeffrey Kincaid. Yeah, Aaron Jeffrey Kincaid. Aaron Jeffrey Kincaid. (laughs) That's difficult to say. And the fact that he uses three names the entire time. I know. Whenever he refers to him, he says Aaron Jeffrey Kincaid, Mm -hmm. I believe. Which, very odd. Yeah. I started shortening it to AJK in my notes. (laughs) But, yeah, so then I was like, well, is he the, the illusionist? I'm like, he can't be. Like, that. we would know that right from the the prologue of the book. Well, that's the thing. It'd be very odd to start off with the murderer 
Or it's kind of like, hey, yeah, it's me, here I am. And then just waiting for the detective to actually catch up. I know. Where the reader and the criminal are Everybody already knows. Like, that'd be quite odd. Yeah. One thing we'll say, the book is written in first-person perspective, but Pat refers to himself in third person sometimes, which, (laughs) that's just cringy, dude. (laughs) That'd be like, yes. Jess is now recording the podcast. I'm like, no, just, no, that's weird, dude. What do you mean? Janine does that all the time. <laughs> like, it's just odd when people yeah. refer to themselves in the third person. Like, it is weird. Kind of gives you narcissist vibes. <laughs> so, I but know. that being said, it also sounds like the illusionist gave himself the nickname. Yeah. Which is also, like, dude. I know. You're not exactly all there morally speaking because you are a serial killer yes but like there's serial killers and then there's like have the courtesy to let the media give you a nickname yeah <laughs> i know and for a bit i was like well why is he an illusionist but also using chess pieces mm-hmm. and why like i don't know i'm not it's like i just feel like there's a lot of stuff happening mm-hmm. but it's not totally connecting yet yeah, like we've read till the end of chapter 45. Mm-hmm. We were supposed to read till the end of 44, and I totally missed the fact that. Okay. <laughs> no, I looked at my chapter headings. I'm like, 43, great, I'll read the next chapter, I'll be done, awesome. And then stuff started happening. So I just kept reading, and I totally missed <laughs> the end. Like, well, with this, ah. like, I will say this book is a page turner. Mm-hmm. It's not slow, it's interesting. If you like this type of book, it's actually so yeah. far quite good, I would say. It is decent. Like, when it comes to Christian fiction thrillers, oftentimes it's very sanitized Mm -hmm. and very um, investigative pacing, which is to say slow. Very, Mm -hmm. very slow. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a little bit better. Like, you're never bored. No. You're annoyed at times. Uh Uh-huh. But you're never bored. No. And I'm just trying to figure out how the storylines connect and there's something going on with that governor he's kind of shady well yeah i did make a note that the gov- governor's a creep mm-hmm. um very very short chapters too yes which i found out. but i like short chapters because i feel like it the it pacing scoots quicker yeah it really does i will say i'm not a huge fan of the main character <laughs> he's he's a bit of a he's a bit smackable <laughs> Like, he's, when he's giving his talk about how, he's explaining what he does. And he's a environmental analyst? Environmental? Yeah, forensic environmental something? Something along those lines. Anyway, he takes a look at the environment of the crime. You know, what time of day was it? What kind of, like, what was the traffic like? You know, any special trees in the area? <laughs> yeah. That kind of thing. Well, he's got all these things that he puts into this program, right? Mm-hmm. Which helps them to pinpoint a location of where the killer resides, I think. Or some kind of the central commonalities location. Commonalities in between yeah. the different... Especially, like, they've got four murderers right now. Four or five? Is Jolene five? Five or six, I want to say. Yeah. Let's go five. Um, so, to kind of highlight where there's overlap between each scene mm-hmm. and the, the victim's travel patterns and that kind of thing. Yeah. And it, like that part to me was very interesting to like, so he doesn't just look at the basic evidence that you would look at, but mm-hmm. like the broader picture of the details. I mean, parts of it were a little bit dull. I found it interesting. My thing was when he was explaining to the rest of the cops or FBI or whatever, what he was doing, and he kept going, oh, the, mor- the uh, moral and the motive don't matter. The, the motives don't matter. But the motives do matter. But the motives do matter. Like, yeah. he was very much like, no, my way of investigating is the best way. Mm-hmm. Because you're not examining the motives. And he was sniping a bit with the um, behavioral analyst or... Oh, her uh, the profiler. The profiler, yes. Um, because she's going, no, motives do matter mm-hmm. because motives lead to choosing things and he's harping on about how there's a million different motives for everything that we do and the fact that they couldn't both just understand the concept of it's not either or yeah it's both both and like yeah i know but it was like a different approach to solving crime mm-hmm. for sure it, it's very much the house approach to writing fiction <laughs> for his and it was also He's not a diagnostic analyst or whatever the heck he is. <laughs> it was also really interesting to me that um, the illusionist has 
his crime so well planned out that he already has his next victim Mm -hmm. before he kills his current victim because he took the contact lenses from a future victim and put them on to a current victim. A current victim. So, yeah, this woman was killed. She was found with contact lenses on her eyes. She was not a contact lens wearer. Her contact lens prescription matched the next woman that was killed. Mm -hmm. And I just, like, the thing about this sort of stuff that gets me is how those people's minds work you know that's why true crime fascinates me so much because i just like what is going through their head and how do they justify killing somebody first of all what even brings somebody like the motive the motive part is the part that kind of Mm -hmm. and yeah i just like trying to figure out like how does he even pick his victims yeah like with allison i think it's allison the one he snuck into her house and stole her hairbrush Mm -hmm. um she had the abusive Mm ex-husband and it sounded like he killed the husband it sounded like he did yeah um no mention of that from alice's point of view so i don't know if she just haven't found they don't know yet because there was a note left that he had taken off to go to florida or something right so and he's kind of going on about how like they'll be better off but then he's very clearly lining her up to be the next victim and at one point he Mm -hmm. goes like okay well now it's time to kill her first like i know where I don't understand quite where he's coming from in terms of Mm -hmm. choosing his victims because I mean oftentimes it'll be like I'll be blondes or I'll be you know yeah certain look or certain like they have a type right yeah Mm -hmm. where this doesn't really seem to be for the most part well or maybe it's just not clear to us yet what that is right um yeah like there's so many unanswered questions which like I said to you before we started recording, we have to stop picking (laughs) series because I feel like after I'm done this one, I'm going to want to read more. I know that they won't all be about this character, like the illusionist. Mm -hmm. I assume. I assume it's not going to take eight books to solve this crime. I hope not. Because that would be ridiculous. But anyway. I recall correctly, my friend read this series in high school and she was telling me about it. And I remember pretty much nothing of it. But I think, if I recall correctly, there is one serial killer that goes through all the books okay so i don't know if the illusionist is gonna go through all of them or if there's another one okay because they also talked about a copycat Mm -hmm. in this book because some of the victims didn't have i very much feel like there is two serial killers in this book yeah one of them is aaron jeffrey kincaid i'm pretty sure yes and then the other one is the illusionist i just don't know if aaron jeffrey kincaid is actually like he's a serial killer Mm -hmm. because he mentioned doing tests on uh, like he yeah. had another suicide pact well, thingy and he's going talking on. about father he keeps talking about father mm-hmm. and something happened in the jungle yeah i feel like maybe cult related it felt very culty because it was something about they drank some juice or did some something else. yeah and, everybody's... and somehow he got out of there alive and obviously that affected him mm-hmm. um so yeah so okay. there's that whole story also but i don't know that he's actually killed anybody yet like, no, he killed the girl. He at killed the, the girl at the beginning, and he's killing. He has the, two other people. Two other people in, in a room a or something, glass right? Box or something. Yeah. It seems like he's doing like experiments or something. Um, biological warfare testing on them. Mm. The vibe I got. But they're fairly upfront with what he does. Mm-hmm. That's true. But I don't know that he's actually committed any of these four or five murders for right. like the yellow ribbons and whatnot. Right. At least not that I know. Right. Maybe there's three serial killers. Maybe there's three. I don't know. Oh, my word. Don't move to this town. I know, right? North that's, Carolina. Do not go there. That's the thing, too. Okay. Patrick. Mm-hmm. I've got a bone to pick with him. He knows that there's an active serial killer, which is why he's there. What does he do? He tells his daughter to get on a plane and come to where the active serial killer is. Mm-hmm. When she's fairly close to the profile type in that she's young and she's a woman. What the hell, dude? And plus, the, one of the serial killers call him basically going yeah i know you have a daughter and what the Mm -hmm. heck are you doing dude like back off and now you go and you bring your daughter here you idiot yep he is an idiot like but he also doesn't have a great relationship with her well it's not his daughter it's it's his his stepdaughter stepdaughter. and his her mom died yeah so currently his stepdaughter mostly lives with his parents Mm -hmm. and he isn't home a lot it sounds like and just all the elements of bad relationship Mm mm-hmm bad parenting bad probably he doesn't know what to do with the teenage daughter yeah yeah you know doesn't sound like it honestly (laughs) i mean i'd say that's pretty common for a lot of men probably yeah yeah pretty much (laughs) uh, or just anybody teenagers are weird (laughs) 
sorry to any teenagers listening to this. <laughs> I mean, we were all You'll one. understand when you're old. Well, we were all one at one point. We know. Never. Okay, not you. I was you 63 skipped, from the moment I was born. You skipped those years. <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah. But One of the theories I had going on before I got to chapter 45 <laughs> was, is it a split personality thing? Because Aaron could be referring to himself as the illusionist as a kind of alter ego. Maybe. Like. Well, that's interesting. It's like with the Paul Murdoch case where he kept referring to himself as Timmy whenever he got drunk and started acting like a lunatic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> ah, like, yes. It is hypothetically possibly that. It could be a split personality plus a second serial killer. So many options. There are. I, but, like, part of me is just skeptical of every character. I <laughs> want it to be Pat at the end. It's like, <laughs> checkmate, it was me. <laughs> but even, like, his buddy Ralph, I was like, oh, it's Ralph. He's sketchy. And then I was like, no, it can't be him. I don't know. Ralph is... I, I'm more suspicious of Tanner? Yes, Tucker. Tucker. Right? There we go. <laughs> Start with a T. I knew that much. Yes. That's, I wrote that down at one point. Is he the illusionist? Yeah. So, yeah. But, I mean, the illusionist, I started calling him this d- disillusionist in my <laughs> He gives us ser- serious incel vibes, honestly. Yeah. He seems like a basement dweller. <laughs> like. Yes. Well, then they found the cave that he had been using. Mm-hmm. And that was pretty, like, like you had to coincidence. rappel down to yeah. the cage. But Patrick's the one who found the cage, right? The cage. The cave. cave. Yeah. Patrick found the cave. Um... Because she, the victim that they found on the hiking trail had different mud in her toe ring. Yes. So he automatically thought, is there any caves in the area? Which then led him to a cave that was not on any maps. Mm-hmm. And the only way to get in was to rappel down, I think he said, like, something like 10 feet. Yeah, and somehow he's a rock climber, mm-hmm. of course, in his spare time. And uh, But how could he rappel down 10 feet while holding a woman? That's the thing. I don't think he actually held the women. Because if you think, like, Did when he... they were describing her um, ligature marks and whatnot, there was a faint line around her waist. Oh, so he lowered her down. So I believe the theory was that he hung her by the neck until she died. Because strangulation is his shtick. And then, like, he basically just dangled her over the edge. So he didn't actually ever have to necessarily go down and could then carry her back up because okay. when she was dead he could just rail her in like fish right sorry <laughs> but he also did mention that there was a very clear brushing marks on the bottom like somebody brushed footprints and stuff away mm-hmm. so he probably went down there to pick up something but i mean the yellow ribbon was also left down there yeah so he was down there so he was down but maybe there. she wasn't down there is what you're saying yeah but like he could have gone down to you know clean up a little bit of blood or whatever mm-hmm but I think they did find some blood spots down there, though. Is yeah, there was right? dark marks. Yeah. And they... Or what they assumed. They hadn't actually confirmed it. Yeah. The thing that drives me bonkers. They're driving back, and they're doing all this research and whatnot, and looking into and they think, okay, there's a guy that works at a gym who's also a local hiking guide and into Native American um, history and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Jump on this guy, determine that he is definitely the murderer. No proof. All speculation at this point. Go and try and get a warrant, which they're told, haha, no, because you don't. Well, I shouldn't say they go and try and get a warrant. They call Margaret, right? Yeah. To and see she tells them that they're not going to get a warrant because yeah. they don't have any evidence because they don't have any evidence. <laughs> so these lovely, upstanding, law abiding citizens go and break into the guy's house, <laughs> where once again they find nothing. Nothing. He finds a scrap of paper in a fireplace. Mm-hmm. That is it. This guy has an alarm triggered for his door, and he's got cameras. So he sees them go in, and there's a five-minute countdown. This guy, who has nothing, they have nothing on him, then blows up his own house, proving that there is something there to look for. Mm -hmm. Dude, there was nothing. You could have literally just left it and not blown up your house. Now you look very suspicious. Mm -hmm. Drive me bonkers. (laughs) And, and, they get out of the house, right? Patrick shields, what's her face? Oh, uh, what is her name? Lien? Something like that. With his body and gets a six inch piece of wood stuck in his back. Yeah. Which he promptly deals with three hours later. 
<laughs> yeah. I, oh, no, no. I don't need stitches. It's fine. It's fine. I'm fine. It's fine. Like, I always run around with a three-inch piece of wood in my back. I like yeah. to pretend I'm a stegosaurus, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Are you kidding me? We're going to have to change his name to Patrick Stegosaurus. Oh, I, yes. He's just Stegosaurus from now on. So there are Holy obviously some ass. things in this book that were bothering you. Yes. Because <laughs> the thing is, if he hadn't blown up the house... Oh, yeah, sure. Circumstantially, he looks quite suspicious. Mm -hmm. But he is guaranteed not the only hiking guide with an interest in Native American culture in that area. Yeah. They had nothing on him. He just blew up the house, and now Mm -hmm. it's like, well, we're definitely looking through there again. Yeah, exactly. Well, obviously, like, why else would you want to blow up the house? And why are you watching the house if you've got nothing to hide? Well, a lot of people have cameras and stuff in their homes these days, but... This is 2008, before the era of everybody's got cameras everywhere. But do they also have bombs? Well, I don't know about you, but I certainly do. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. In your rental? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never going to my house. <laughs> Just no, like, landlord shows up. <laughs> it's pretty weird for Canada. Yeah, it is. Like, it's definitely weird. It's mm-hmm. not regular, especially to have it on a five-minute timer. Yeah, that's true. Because if I ever had to break into my house because I locked up my keys or something, that I need more than five minutes to get stuff together. Yeah. Like, I know. It's... Yeah, that part was a little bit like, dude, why are you blowing up the house? Yeah. Very odd. That bugged me. I don't know. Maybe we'll get more answers. Maybe. I have to say, I am fully invested, though. Oh, now. yes. I need to know. I know. And I should probably read the next eight books. <laughs> Oh, mm. there's actually only seven more, but there is a book zero that it, I guess comes before this. Yeah, which I find a little I don't know. odd, but zero was published after, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. I don't really like when publishers do that because... I'm not a fan. I don't want to go back and read something that happened before what I already read. Well, then you end up with the Chronicles of Narnia problem, where is The Magician's Nephew the first book, or is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Because The Magician's Nephew was published, I think, fourth. Yeah. Yeah, like... I mean, I get why, because The Magician's Nephew is really good, and it yeah. does explain how Narnia came to be created. But does that mean it has to be read first? I would recommend it. Yeah, but obviously the other I one... I would definitely recommend with Chronicles of Narnia, you read according to volume number, not according to publishing date, because I think it makes more sense that way. But that's not... <laughs> that's an aside. <laughs> it's random. But, no, like, it's the jump from oh there's a cave to oh it must be this guy to oh let's break in his house to oh oops we blew up his house is very quick like that happens in an afternoon yeah everything is happening very quickly here though like and like granted the murders are happening fairly quick too mm -hmm. which does mean that you get more evidence and you kind of have to hustle but yeah and at one point they almost catch him at a shopping mall Mm mm-hmm which to me also was a little bit strange because I was like, really? Why is he like just... I mean, I get that they like to hang around and watch and whatever, but well, he he's like taunting his them. the next victim. Yeah. It's the... I, I can understand the serial killer being at the shopping mall. To me, that makes sense because it's a great place to find new victims. Well, uh, that's where he Not got... an advertisement. <laughs> that's where he got his next victim, right? Yeah, but it's the police being there quick enough yeah that was the thing too i was like how did they get there so fast and then just found another random professor who was having an affair with one of his students yeah like just at random and that guy ended up getting shot because and then there was was a decoy the chess piece left in their van yeah which like how does that that's the part where i'm like how does that relate to anything what does that have to do with anything yeah and so that whole part to me too was kind of like what Seems a little bit random. Mm-hmm. Like they're trying to throw it off and go, oh, maybe it's the professor. Where it's like, eh, it's not. No. Like, very odd. Very, but, very odd. Yeah. Hopefully, all these questions become answered in part two. That would definitely be nice because if we hit the end of the book and I still have to read seven more to find out who the serial killer is, <laughs> I'm going to be annoyed. Me too. I need at least one serial killer solved to put behind bars. Yeah, because I have many other non-related books that I want to read. <laughs> so It's an entire library I have to get to. I don't have time for all of these books. Yeah. What do you Person. think of Severon? Who I keep wanting to pronounce Chevron. Isn't it Severn? Severn? I don't know. Laverne. <laughs> Can we just call him Laverne? He's a serial he's, killer. Let's just call him Laverne. He's shady. I, well... Based on what we read, I feel like he's the illusionist. 
or he could yeah, be. Yeah, but that, like, the, the guy who blew up his own house, because he's very tactful, mm-hmm. was jo- jo- little, 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 Joseph Grolin. But is it, though? But that's is that an alias? Is Sev- Severn? Severn? I think it's S E. I think it's S E V E R N, right? Something like that. I don't know. I just when I read it, I just kept going to call him Chevron. It's in my head now, <laughs> so I will mispronounce this about fifteen million times, and I apologize, but not enough to make myself stop. <laughs> is he Joseph, or is Joseph him? Yeah. Or is Joseph Aaron? Because Aaron's still floating around out there too. Yeah, but I think, like, I feel like the illusionist is the one who blew up the house. Yeah. So then, I feel like the whatever the name of that hiking guide Joseph was an alias. I don't know if that's his real name. That's that was what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, Joseph being the illusionist, blowing up his own house, and being I don't know, like there's the whole copycat killer theory. Yeah. Who's copying who? Yeah. And Severin, Severing dude, um, he was in an orphanage with Aaron. Mm-hmm. And he tied a yellow... Yeah, he's yeah, the one that ties a, the yellow ribbon. He kills the cat. Yeah. And he tied a yellow ribbon around. And when he found his mom's body, he tied a yellow ribbon in her hair. Yes. So... And now he oh, there's always a ye- yellow ribbon with the victims. Mm-hmm. We just need to read the second half. I know. <laughs> like, That's there's true. a lot of moving pieces. Like, there could mm-hmm. be up to three serial killers. I don't think there is. I think there's no. two. No. I, I would say two at most, but... but and, uh, Joseph could be innocent but paranoid. But, I mean, blowing up your own house is a bit of a stretch. But that is a little... I don't know. I think that he's the illusionist. to his... See, that's the thing. Like, as I was reading the part where they're like, oh, you know, they're, they're racing to go get this guy and break in his house because that's totally legal. It's... As I was reading that, I'm going, like, we still have over half the book left. I know. So that makes me think it's not him. Yeah, and I said because he can't be because we're not even half done. <laughs> exactly. Like, to already have caught one of the serial killers this early, and if I remember correctly, and keep in mind, my friend read this in, like, grade nine, and I'm very old, <laughs> that if I'm right in remembering that there's one main serial killer throughout and then a bunch of little guys, weird, um, that means that the rest of the book is spent on just the guy that we're not going to find out about till the end of the series which to me seems very odd yeah but they haven't technically caught him yet either so no no there is that but yeah i I don't know i know it's a mystery if they spend the next half of the book just trying to track him down that'll be annoying yeah the pace that it's going the pace that it's going it can't slow down right like it only has to intensify don't you think like a good writer is that's what a good writer would do in my opinion. Yeah, and he's won four awards, so... <laughs> he won four awards. Dozens, actually. Dozens of honors and awards, including four Christie Awards. Right, four Christie Awards. Okay, honestly, the Christie Awards... Okay, you know that brand of cookies? Yeah. It's like, mm, Mr. Christie? Mr. Christie, you make good cookies. Yeah. It's just what's in my head with Christie Awards. You just make the best cookies. <laughs> oh, it is a random day today. I think they're just actually named after a book. An inspirational fiction novel called Christy. Mm. I'll take your word for it. Yeah. You I should. don't pay much attention to awards. No, me neither. But I don't know. I, I'm interested to see how the second half of the book goes if it is actually Joseph. Yeah. Or Tucker. Or Tucker. I'm still suspicious of Tucker. I am. Because he talked about having a date. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he was in super early that next morning. And although he was chasing him at the mall would he not have recognized him i don't think he ever got a good look at him maybe he didn't because the slightly creepy dude from the mall that was following the girl backed off when he saw a big tall guy standing beside her but he didn't actually give a decent description right right and 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 bowers is like doesn't really know he just only has met tucker like the day before right Mm -hmm. so that's true i guess that's that was a stupid comment no no it's valid but, like, he also, I don't think, ever saw a good look at him. Like, his, you know, shadow runs this way. A yeah. Dark guy runs that way in terms of, like, they yeah. were chasing him at night. hmm And when the creepy professor got shot, it was in, like, a dark alley. It was in a parking area. garage. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Like, none, he's yeah. not skipping through the countryside in broad daylight. <laughs> we we'll uh, to commit a murder. A wonderful murder or two. <laughs> Feel free to edit that out if that's not. <laughs> don't. Don't edit it. Just leave it. 
Uh, yeah, no, I'm a... Tucker, I don't know. I think he's suspicious. And there's some sort of government something happening oh, also. Oh, that senator, governor, whatever yeah, he is, governor. creepy dude. Mm-hmm. Creepy, creepy, creepy dude. He is some kind of shady. Like, he is definitely involved... With something. With something. I wonder if he has something to do with what's going on with Aaron Jeffrey Kincaid. Yeah, like, Aaron, it sounded like he wanted to kill the governor. Be- er, I'm getting biological warfare vibes from that dude. Because he was talking about... Governor or senator? Governor. Governor. Yeah. He was talking about the governor's itinerary and how it was perfect because he went to the... Like, after the awards dinner thing that he's supposed mm-hmm. to go to in the area, he then went to the Pentagon, he went to... A couple other high-profile locations, mm-hmm. and how that was perfect because it would spread more. So I think Aaron's not working for the governor. But I think the, he's trying to infect him. I wonder if the governor had something to do with whatever happened in the jungle. Entirely possible. So, I mean, the whole jungle thing hasn't been adequately explained at all no. yet. I mean, it sounds very culty. It sounds very culty. But, but it's then, also like men coming in to shoot him, which sounds very military. But then you have military, you have cults, you have possible biological warfare, you have serial killer. Like, that's a lot of themes going on in one book. How is this all going to come yeah. together in the end? That's the thing that I am not sure about. There's a lot happening. There's a lot. A like, lot, a lot. It, and it's not a crazy thick book either. Like It's, it's not. It's fairly standard adult fiction it's about like 400 and some pages like yeah. pretty normal pretty average and half of those are blank pages because they have super short chapters yeah yeah so i don't know i'm very yeah. interested to see how the second half goes how's it all gonna come together how is bowers gonna tie it all up with a nice yellow bow <laughs> turns out he is a serial killer do you have any predictions for the second half i really feel like there's something sketchy about tucker I don't think that Aaron Jeffrey Kincaid is the illusionist. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, but he's some some kind of crazy. He's definitely a serial killer. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he's done some of the murders. The copycat ones, maybe. Maybe. Although he seemed surprised when he heard all the details. Yeah, because like, he didn't he heard seem about like the yellow ribbon. Yeah. He immediately thought of what's his face. Yeah, he didn't seem like he knew. Yeah. that this had been going on. So I don't know that he's responsible for the copycats. So I'm not really sure. Maybe in the end they're all going to come to Jesus. I don't know, because he hasn't even been <laughs> mentioned yet. <laughs> We've never even heard about him. <laughs> this so far does not read his Christian fiction. No. In the slightest. Well, there was there was a little bit. Yeah, but he was... It but was yeah, a case it's... of him snarking at a pastor who was frankly being pushy and not a very nice dude. Well, and didn't the one mom... When his wife was dying, which, to- totally fair. Didn't the one mom take her kids to church or something, too, I think? Yeah, but that's not at it's all. It's very... That, that doesn't make a Christian it's fiction It's very book. subtle. Yeah. Very subtle. Like, unless there's some kind of big come-to-Jesus moment in the second half, this yeah. you like... If the fact that this book is labeled as Christian fiction puts you off, don't let it. So far, So not far. Hard. Yep. If you can handle the word God happening, you know, at least three times, you're fine. <laughs> yeah. But if you don't like a little bit of gore, I would suggest not picking it up. Oh, yes. This book is not squeaky clean. This is not your no. sanitized Christian fiction no. thriller where it's like, fade to black. No, like, no, this is that's true. pretty... I mean, it's not... It's honest. It's not Dahmer, but it is <laughs> not squeaky clean in the slightest. No, no. So... Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to the second half. Me too. I have to know what happens. I'm very annoyed I had to stop. I know. Oh. I know. And then you texted me and were like, can you please read chapter 45 too? And I was like, done. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I'm like, because I accidentally read too far. And that's where, like, that's the chapter where we find all out about the orphanage. And, yeah. you know, the kid's mom dying in the yellow ribbons. And mm-hmm. the fact that he's probably one of the murderers. There's a lot going on in that one chapter. Like, like, I know. There's no way I can keep my mouth <laughs> shut when we're recording and not spoil that. I should have texted you back. I see you're 45 <laughs> and raise you a 46. He's <laughs> just like, oh, oops, we read the entire book. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> oops, Daisy. <laughs> yeah, no. It'll be, uh, we'll see. What are, you, what are your thoughts on the second half? Your predictions? Two serial killers. I don't think Tucker is one of them. I don't think Tucker's one of them. Okay. I think he's shifty. Mm-hmm. I think there's something going on there, but I don't think he's one of them. Okay. 
There's definitely something up, Governor. Patrick is going to do something stupid and refer to himself in the third person. <laughs> Probably while running around looking look like a stegosaurus. <laughs> but, and Stega Patrick. Like, his daughter hasn't actually shown up in town yet. So I mm. would not be surprised if she gets kidnapped at some point. Because why else would you have a daughter in a true crime book? It's literally yes. just so that you can do the whole Liam Neeson shtick. True enough. Although this was probably before that. Mm, when was Taken filmed? I have no idea. I've not seen it. I just know a couple of quotes, but yeah, I'm very interested. I think we're going to find out about the one serial killer, and I think that mystery is going to be solved. I don't think the other one will. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Well, we'll see what happens next time. Yes. Join us then when we know all and we'll tell all. We are back with part two of The Pawn. So I'm going to start off by saying there was a lot in the second half of this book. Mm Mm-hmm. A lot, a lot. I'm pretty sure every single prediction we made was completely wrong. Probably. The only prediction, the only predictions I wrote down was if Tucker was the illusionist. And I said yes, and you said no, and you were right, and I was wrong. Tucker Uh was actually a good guy in the end. Tried to save Tessa. Yes, and died doing it. Mm Mm-hmm. A lot of people died in the second half. There was a lot of death. It's just like, uh, ah, let's clear out some of these extra characters. (laughs) I also... I sort of feel like there was two kind of major storylines happening, Mm -hmm. and I'm not fully sure they intersected very well. Towards the end, everything got a little bit muddled. Kind of. Like, I think he did an okay-ish job, Mm -hmm. but it definitely wasn't the best handling of it I've ever seen in my life. Well, it was just like, there was this whole serial killer story which is how the book started right Mm -hmm. but then he brings in this whole cult jonestown story that's the thing the only intersection between the two was that somebody who was at jonestown a kid Mm -hmm. knew the illusionist they were at like when they were kids yeah yeah foster home and that was basically like the only point the only way that they intersected and i just like okay do you want to write a cult story do you want to write a serial killer story like I think I think he was trying to do too much in this book. I don't know. I For think me, the cult part and the serial killer part is fine. It's the senator part that I'm like, okay, stop it. <laughs> You're going too far now. Not that, like, add the senator in there. He's part of the story, whatever. But there was too much focus on the senator. Like, it was... How do I put this? Okay, you had... Um, what's his face? Aaron Jeffrey Kincaid who was at Jonestown, started his own cult, because what else are you going to do? And one of his guys was the copycat killer. The senator was at Jonestown as a CIA operative, was it? I think so. He was one of the alphabet boys, anyway. Um, Who killed two people there. It was part of a big conspiracy cover-up thing. He knows that a kid survived. Mm -hmm. Then you have... The actual illusionist, who does the serial killer thing, knew Aaron jo- Jeffrey Kincaid when they were both in the foster home, and knows that Aaron Jeffrey Kincaid sent somebody, or had somebody copycat his kills. There's a point where I'm going, do we need the senator in here? I would argue we don't. Hmm. Not at least to, like, he could have been a fairly minor role. Yeah. But he turned out to be kind of one of the big baddies at the end, which I'm like, See, we really need that. Because he still escaped. Like, he's roaming around out there. Yeah, that's true. But also, looking back, I think he sort of connected the two as well. Because he had, like... Didn't he have somebody, like, a crooked cop or something? There was the informant. Right. So he was sort of working with the illusionists on that side also, right? Um, Like, there was a little bit of connection there as well, I feel like. The informant knew something about... Is it something about the illusionist or something about Aaron Jeffrey Kincaid? I don't remember. There was so much that happened in the second half. It was to the point where that guy showed up in the senator's room, and I went, who's this? (laughs) (laughs) That guy had been there before. The uh, But he was such a minor character to kind of show up there. So he was a P.I., private yeah. investigator and he was looking into one of the deaths of one of the copycat killers yeah because he was the one that broke into Pat's apartment or yeah wherever he was staying his hotel sure and then somehow the senator got him and was like trailing pat i think mm-hmm. 
And but then there was also the contact he had in the local police or FBI or whatever. Yeah. Because when Pat called the cops to go, hey, there's a dude in my room, come get him. Um, they showed up and basically went, ah, yes, that guy. Yeah. And it turned out that there was an informant in the police station as well who was feeding PI information, who was then giving it to the senator, who was then doing, what? Too many people. And also at the safe house where Pat and Tessa were staying, Mm -hmm. one of those guards was also... Yeah. Right? And he, like, got the necklace to give to the illusionist. Yeah, that was the same one. That was the... The one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was also, I guess, a connection between the two storylines. But, like, it was a lot. And so some of the chapters would go back and forth between, like, Mm -hmm. narrators. So now we're hearing Aaron, Jeffrey, Kincaid. Now we're hearing Pat. And it would, like, quickly go back and forth. And, like... Yeah, without any kind of, like, break or, like... Well, there was, like, a line. Yeah, but, like... But, like... Visually, there wasn't much to indicate that you were switching. And to me... So sometimes that was hard to follow, but also I felt like it added to the suspense because you're like, you know, it sort of like abruptly ends and then you're on to a different story and you're like, well, what's going on here? And then it's like back and forth. But and he like, went quick enough that you didn't lose it because there's yeah. some, I'm going to use this show Lost, for example, where they do all this build up and there's this giant mystery and then they leave it alone for like two episodes. And by the time they come back to it, you don't care anymore. Mm, yeah, no, like that was completely lost the suspense. He went quick enough. Yeah. That he, you didn't really lose it. It was kind of like, this is happening and this is happening. And, like, you're not sure of the timing between the two. So mm-hmm. are they going to get there in time? Like, it read yeah. a little bit like a action film. So this author, Stephen James, is very good at writing suspense, mm-hmm. I would say. Except for when it comes to some of his descriptions. Because some of his descriptions just kind of take you out of it. <laughs> well, I feel like you can tell that this is a bit of an older book Mm -hmm. just by some of the ways that it's written also the coffee enough with the coffee enough with the coffee and seriously dude stop with the phones (laughs) like it felt like they're trying to add like cute little quirks to his personality where it's like no yeah he's just being annoying yeah i didn't really care for pat oh no i don't care about pat at all um i do want to read more in this series though because it was interesting it was very well written. It was very interesting. I hope they simplified a little bit with the storylines next yeah. time. I don't think that Severin's dead. I don't think he is either. No. Squished by an ambulance, but they haven't found a body. Mm-hmm. Screams Disney. <laughs> <laughs> well, they always do the dramatic fall off a cliff. <laughs> but you don't ever get the dead body, so, you know, you can still kind of bring him back if you want yep. to. Yep, I think so. So And so at the end... And plus, he was just too good a villain not to be bad. <laughs> he was creepy, I thought. Well, like, AJK was creepy in, like, the culty way, yeah. where it's just, like, anybody that tells me to worship them, I'm automatically going, ugh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but he was kind of, like, stereotypically creepy. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, Severin was a paramedic. Mm-hmm. They had no idea. Mm-hmm. Like, they basically stumbled onto who he was pretty much by accident. Yeah. but And, like, he was just so good at being creepy. Yeah. And also, like, there was no real motive. They had no backstory to him whatsoever, which makes me think that he continues and you get more backstory well, throughout I guess the rest of the series. Because his mom was a prostitute and she got killed. Yeah, but, like... Right? So pretty... is he trying to avenge his mother's death? Then you would think he would be killing Johns instead of... Yeah. You never know when it comes to that because it's, well... The brain is not functioning normally yeah like you got a little bit of his backstory but not not much yeah aside from the mother story and the one story at the orphanage or yeah where he kills a squirrel i thought it was a cat was it a cat well maybe it was a cat i can't remember there's a lot of there's a lot of detail in this detail yep so yeah and all like all the jonestown stuff like Mm -hmm. creepy as all get out I was kind of surprised he went that far into I know. the Jonestown details. I know. I wasn't expecting him to base it on the cult, on a real event that happened. Mm-hmm. Like, I was fully expecting that to be, you know, a fake cult that he made up. Yeah. I wasn't expecting an actual thing. Yeah. So that, it, it added to the creep factor because it actually yeah, happened. It I actually mean, happens. I, he clearly played a little bit around with a little bit of the details and whatnot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that really added to it. Yep. Like, that bit of true crime in the middle of fictional crime yep i know i did enjoy this book yeah. there was some parts that were a bit me but 
<laughs> a bit ye. Yeah. <laughs> there were some that were a little bit too um, law and order cheesy. Yeah. Not not to be sexist, but when it comes to some of the like emotional bits, yeah, I'm like this was by a man. Yep. I know. Like the stuff with uh, it felt very much like he he wrote a thriller, did a great job on it. And then his editor came along and went, you have to add some emotional crap in there. Yeah. And he went, fine. <laughs> and then put it in, even though knowing he wasn't good at it. Yeah. And his editor didn't edit it very well. No. Nope. I, yeah, that's, I think I wrote down at one point, blech, <laughs> Lian Hua and Pat. Yeah, that I'm like, and eh, let's maybe not go too far into that because it's yeah. kind of cringy. Can't they just be friends? Yeah. And good coworkers and colleagues? Yeah. Yeah. That would be nice. So that also, was. Also, there were times where he was a little derogatory towards women. Or yeah. like, <laughs> excuse me? I hope you run into a woman serial killer in this episode <laughs> series somewhere because. Yes. It would serve you right. Yeah. And so. Plus equality. No, well, that, that I'm um, campaigning for serial killers. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know. I kind of don't think that's the direction this author is going to take. I would be quite shocked. Um, but yeah, like, like I say, you can definitely tell. This book was a little bit older. 2008. 2007. Oh, 2007, my mistake. He mentions yeah. 2008 yeah. in the book. So, but definitely I do want to read more of this series. Mm-hmm. I think at the end they talk about a prisoner that was up for parole, Richard Basque. Right. Something about DNA. I wonder if he's going to be the focus of the next book or one of the books coming up. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Because that'd definitely be an interesting one because he said like that was one of the ones that still bugged him. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. entirely possible. That was my prediction. So. The Joshua Groland? Mm-hmm. That was a nice twist. I yeah. wasn't expecting that one. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. That was good. Um, also sinister, though, with, like, the toy guns taped to his mm-hmm. hands. And, like, I mean, the way this guy's mind works. Really, really good job on the, the twists and turns. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. Really bad job on Tessa. I hate <laughs> that kid. I don't think you're supposed to love her. Oh, well, like, they're, A, why is Pat bringing her in? I know I said this last time, too. Mm-hmm. Why the heck is he taking her from Denver, where she's safely ensconced with his parents to an active crime scene where he doesn't have a house. He's living in an apartment or a hotel, basically. Mm -hmm. Disrupts her life, her school, everything, because she'll be safer where there is two active serial killers. Um, And what is she supposed to do while he's at work? Yeah. Like, is is he taking her along to crime scenes? Because he didn't seem to think that was a good idea. Yeah, even though he did take her to But he did take her. Yeah, I don't so, know. So, like, what was the point in her being there other than, oh, we have to make this guy seem slightly human and there's this kid that keeps pop- tagging around? Like, <laughs> I think it was supposed to help build the relationship, like, to I make mean, them be pals. It honestly just seemed <laughs> like he dragged her in so that there would be a victim that Pat cared about at some point. Mm. Because it, it literally just felt like it was a setup so that, ah, here we go, the serial killer can kidnap her next. And once it was somebody that he knew and cared about... All of a sudden he... All the pieces clicked. Three seconds, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, I know. That part, too, was kind of like, why did he bring her here? He doesn't... doesn't I sense. guess she was guarded by cops, but they could have had the Denver police watching her also. Yeah. And then she could have stayed where she was. Exactly. Like, that would have made so. way more sense. Yeah. But also, Tess is just annoying. <laughs> She's like, a brat. When he is on the phone and he finds out about the um, AJK's compound thing and mm-hmm. the fact that it's on fire, and he sees all the dead animals, and he's on the phone going, yeah, make sure you guys got guys in hazmat suits because it looks like there's a biological co- compound, blah, 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 blah. And she is just gibbering away in his ear. Oh, what's happening? Oh, is there somebody? Why won't you tell me what's happening? He's like, shut up. <laughs> he just said that there is a biological contagion out there he's trying to deal with this and you are just blithering in his ear like a moron shut up but that was also for me contaminating the meat and then catering the party so they could serve their contaminated meat Mm -hmm. i was like oh it made me never want to eat party food again that's disgusting and creepy and like Mm -hmm. that's horrifying so many aspects of this were just horrifying well, that brings me to my next question. 
Is this a Christian fiction book? Yeah, I don't know. There wasn't a lot of... Uh, there was, like, nothing. A no. couple of annoying preachers that showed up when his wife was dying. Yeah, a few references to God. But nothing um, more than, like, the yeah. average. No, I know. It wasn't, like, definitely not overtly Christian Mm-mm. at all. Um, clean-ish as far as, like... No, not... I mean, language and, like romantic things <laughs> romantic truths <laughs> yeah like as far as that goes yeah but i mean he's busy with serial killer yeah it's pretty tough to get jiggy with it when you got serial killers <laughs> i don't know <laughs> they were in the car on the stakeout it was it was headed oh, in that direction oh not- i know but it was headed in that direction so i yeah i know i was thinking that too i was like mm, would we call this inspirational no. Um, no. Were you inspired? <laughs> Only to read the next book about serial killers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, it feels like it might be trending towards eventually him becoming a Christian or something like that. Like, way down the road in, like, the sixth book or something. Yeah, maybe. But it was basically just him annoyed with the very admittedly annoying preacher when his wife was dying. Because that guy didn't seem to have any kind of concept of not the time. The guy's wife is actively dying and you're going, mm-hmm. God has a plan. Really? Mm-hmm. Not the time. Yeah. And that was pretty much it. I think I would call this a thriller for people who don't like swearing and sex. <laughs> yes. But are fine with gore. Yeah. Because it does not hold back on that degree. No. It's, uh, yeah. It was a little bit full on at times. And like, I'm fine with gore. But there was a point where I'm going, wow, this is a bit much for something labeled inspirational fiction. Yeah. Like the part where they killed all the kids. Yep. That part for me was hard to read. I am glad that Marissa, Marcy? Yeah. That she, when they were serving contaminated meat and whatnot, and everybody was getting arrested, blah, 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 and the rest of the group took their cyanide pills or whatever. Um, I'm glad that she helped out and went, yeah, no, I can tell you what this is and how to cure it and that kind of thing. That was mm-hmm. good. Cause that was good. She kind of felt like she was a bit coerced into the whole thing. She saved the day, and I think she was upset at having to kill her child. Oh, naturally, I yeah. would be. Well, but sometimes when you're in a cult, you're not, yeah. you know, you'd... you brainwashed pretty, pretty hard. Yeah, so people would do it without a second thought because that's what the father told them to do. Ugh. Yeah, well... Cults are cringy. I know, but also fascinating fascinating in the same way that serial killers are fascinating in that study their brains <laughs> <laughs> i know like, it's, it's such a leap mm-hmm. but also not that big of a leap that it's kind of yeah interesting but i listened to a podcast about somebody who had left the nexium cult mm-hmm. and it was fascinating so i definitely like and especially after reading this book too i'm like need to learn more about cults i don't know why but it is one of those things where I think more stuff should be taught about cults. Mm-hmm. There should be more information available because it is very, very easy to get stuck in one. Mm-hmm. Especially when it comes to churches, because a church can go from a regular church to a cult in three seconds or less. <laughs> like, as soon as you get the our church is better than the rest of churches and this leader is best or better than the rest of the leaders it steers into it very quickly and when you're using the words of those leader to justify actions it can it can swing the wrong way very quickly so there needs to be more information so people can recognize the signs really like, yeah is your church a cult <laughs> <laughs> no it's not but, but it's the best church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I don't want to say all churches are cults, because they're not. But there are definitely some that lean more towards the culty side of things, shall we say. Yeah. There. I've done my tap dance. <laughs> Back to Pat. Back to Pat. So he swallowed half of this pill or whatever of miscellaneous drug mm-hmm. and then he d- drives up a mountain hangs off a cliff saves a life squishes a serial killer but probably didn't 
And when he gets back, they basically go, oh yeah, one more milligram of this would have totally killed you. You wouldn't have been able to function. And apparently, mean while he's doing all of this, he's like hallucinating a bit, blacking out and, you know, that kind of crap. Mm-hmm. While driving up a mountain in a snowstorm. It's all part of the thriller aspect. After he just had a six-inch piece of wood in his back that he apparently didn't notice. I think he noticed. He just ignored it. My theory is Pat's a vampire. <laughs> No. (laughs) Pat's an idiot. (laughs) Pat's an idiot. Pat needs to take care of himself. Like, he is written as being a bit too superhuman for my liking. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, I'm fine with, like, the Sherlock aspect of things where it's like, this person is extraordinarily smart, or they look at things in a different way, or they just... The way that they approach a case is has a twist. Mm Mm-hmm. Sure. I start to lose it a little bit when they completely disregard any kind of believability. Yeah. Like, not only did he solve the case, drive up a mountain, hang off a cliff, save a girl, but he did this all in the middle of a snowstorm while tripping. Yeah. It was a bit much. Like, really? They did shoot him up with adrenaline before he left to help him. <clears throat> yeah, do you think maybe somebody could have gone with him? Maybe Probably. drove the car up the mountain? Somebody should have gone with him. He should not have gone alone. Like That's definitely true. The whole thing just kind of read a bit like, I'm Superman. Yeah. Which, mm, there's a reason I don't like Pat. I like the book. The book mm-hmm. is very good. The story is great. Don't like Pat. Yeah. Like, it's just a bit. And I still have problems with the six inches of wood in his back. <laughs> yes i can tell that part was a real sticking point for you i'm sorry you notice a splinter yeah i know i know adrenaline can do a fair amount yeah but you would notice that when you move yeah like i know like get some stitches buddy it's the whole you know the monty python sketch nope okay well there's a knight who's like hopping around on one leg missing the other leg and i think he's got both arms missing and he's going, no, tis but a scratch. <laughs> it's a titch too much like that. Linda, please feel free to add that in. <laughs> add in the meme. May as well. Like, it just comes off a bit too inhuman. Yeah. Like, you lose the air of believability. Unless it was like a case of, uh, you know, how parents can lift cars when it's their child, right? Like. Oh, I'm not discounting the efforts of adrenaline. Yeah. But there is a point where it is unnecessary like, no reason why somebody else couldn't have gone up the mountain. Yeah. No reason why he couldn't have gotten a little bit of help. Like... No, he had to go because he had the climbing experience. He couldn't have brought anybody else to, you know, drive him all the way there. Like, I, I, I don't like Pat. I didn't write the book, okay? I don't what? know. What? You mean you don't have a secret life as an author? I don't. Didn't you not hear me say before, I don't like people reading what I write? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a good book. It is good. It's interesting. It's and I like, mean, I definitely recommend it. Mm-hmm. I mean, if the thing holding you back when you're reading this book is the fact that it's Christian fiction, don't. Don't let that hold you back. <laughs> Trust me, it's not Christian fiction. It's not preachy like, at all. That is not an element in this book. I can't no. say that it's not an element in the series because I haven't read everything yet. Yep. But, like, that part is fine. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that being Agreed. said, if you're looking for a Christian fiction serial killer, there's books out there that will have more Christian fiction and less serial killer possibly uh Abom- abomination by colleen coble comes to mind oh mm, yeah so. that book is that book's pretty full on it's a little intense yeah like oh well, i don't want to ruin it for everybody but it is not bunnies and kittens no i didn't know what it was when i started reading it and i was <laughs> like oh <laughs> the rest of hers like she does tend towards a bit more of the gory thriller aspect in a lot of her books like she she doesn't go like crazy full on but mm-hmm. she is not afraid to kill people off no she's not like, she does have one book that has a scuba diving dog. <laughs> you could go down to, like, 12 feet. It's <laughs> the best part of the book. I don't think I've read that one. It's one of the Hawaiian ones. Oh, I have read the Hawaiian ones. Okay, huh. well, how do you not remember a scuba diving I dog? I don't recall. I was more interested in the dolphins. Oh, I'm there for the dog. Like, she's not afraid to kill people off. Mm-mm. But that one is a bit of a switch from her usual... Mm-hmm. It's a lot more dark than her usual stuff. Yeah, yeah it goes pretty far yeah so so she but it is, is a bit more christian fiction she is a good author i do enjoy her books mm-hmm. for the most part oh. but yeah so i mean i've got to read the next eight books now yes something like that if you count book zero 
Right. There are eight, so there's seven more. Seven more. I'm gonna read the next seven books now, because at the very least, I need to know which serial killer it is that goes through the entire series. Mm -hmm. Which means I'm probably gonna read all seven. <laughs> well, that's just I know. what I do. I know. We'll have to, like, no. We need to do a follow-up episode at some point. Where it's just, okay, we've read the, finally read the rest of the series of all of these. Here's what we think. And just yeah. do short little snippets. That's what I was about to say. But then I was like, no. Then I have <laughs> to read decide, all these read books. books. Oh, man. I mean, I've already read most of them, so I'm good. Most of these books? No, no most of the series that we've read. Yeah. Or the, the ones where we read the first one in the series. I've generally you've read a lot of them. Finished for the rest of the series. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I know. I... We'll slowly work my way through these ones, I think. Yes. I am interested to see if they have audiobooks. Yeah. Because I kind of feel like the audiobooks would read a lot, or be a lot like true crime. In terms yeah. of, yeah, might be a good way of reading them. As long as they're well narrated. Yeah, that's always a thing. That's a thing. Like, I'm very new to the audiobook world. I think we've established that. And I find that the narration makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have two different versions of... Well, the Stormlight Archive series by Brandon Sanderson, one of which is really well narrated. Like they do a spot on job; it's fantastic. And then the other one that is like a digital or um, audio theater type of thing. Okay. I didn't even make it about five minutes in. I went, nope, 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 <laughs> nope. Not my Sanderson. Can't do it. Can't do it. Not doing it. <laughs> Well, the thing that gets me is when a woman is narrating and then a man speaks and then they make their voice all husky. And I hate that. Don't do it. I don't mind when they do a little bit of different voices just because it does differentiate between the characters a bit. Mm. But when they try and go, I'm a big, strong man. <laughs> Whereas like, but you're not. <laughs> well, okay. So the one that I'm listening to right now is a true crime one. So it's nonfiction. So there's a lot of male police officers. Every time she does the same husky voice when no, they're no, speaking. No, no. You, have to you have different... don't. No. See, that's the thing. You have to have somebody that actually a voice actor, not just yeah somebody reading it. See, that's the thing. I maintain that the best audiobooks are YA audiobooks. Because hmm. junior audiobooks, the presenters are tend to be a bit more like <gasps> it's fantastic. Or I'm like, eh, no, it's not. Calm down. The adult audiobooks tend to be a bit more, and then she did this and fell off a cliff. And as she was falling down, she saw the skulls of hundreds of buffalo that had fallen before her. And she realized that she was on an Indian, sorry, Native American reservation with the native buffalo jump, blah, 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 blah. Like, very, very boring. Mm -hmm. YA hits the in-between happy spot mm. of enough emphasis and, like, responding to the situation with the correct emotion without going like, yay! Because <laughs> that is a bit much for me. Okay. Not, not, uh, not for everything, mind you. Nope. The one I just read was awful. Or listened to, I should say. But it does hit that happy medium more consistently. There have been some where I'm like, oh my word, this is awful. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. So. I'm on my, what is it? Would be my fifth, fourth or fifth attempt at a audiobook. So... Successfully completed one. Mm. Try anything by Catherine Kilgren? Mm -mm. Mm. One of the best ones. Okay. Then whoever does Sanderson, which I now forget. Which is no. somebody I want to say? I, uh, the one was by Ann Patchett, narrated by Tom Hanks. Mm. Which I really enjoy listening to Tom Hanks, but the book itself was dull. <laughs> it's the wrong kind of Tom Hanks. Yeah. Uh, Kate Reading and Michael Kramer. Okay. Very good. And, uh, Spare was the one that I finished. No, 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 no. And the book itself was not Awful. spectacular, <laughs> but I did enjoy listening to Prince Harry speak. He has a nice, a good voice for I reading. I couldn't tell you because I think I've heard him say about five words in my life, but yeah. I will maintain that the British accent's one of the easiest to listen to. The accent, yeah. He has a nice voice for listening to. Yeah. So My problem with British accents now is I have 95% of the media I consume tends to be British because they've got the best comedians and shows and, well, most other stuff. I have now hit the point where I can't necessarily tell if somebody has a British accent or not. <laughs> like, it, it's getting to the point where I'm like, no, you just sound normal. What are you talking about? They're not British. Ah. So I didn't know that was a thing that could happen, but apparently <laughs> my brain has gone, well, no, that's just how people sound now. 
until you put somebody offensively American against them. Oh. There is one, um, at the Bloody Jack series, actually, where everything's fairly British. There's British, Irish, Scottish characters. And then they throw in occasionally an American, like Midwestern American. <laughs> Oh, boy. So you go from, like, oh, yes, we'll have a cup of tea to, yay, we shall. <laughs> Where it's like, oh, it's so, it's, like, grating. It's awful. <laughs> I, I can switch from American to British accents. I cannot switch back. It's, oof. It's like someone using a cheese grater on your ears. <laughs> we have gotten way off topic. We are way, way off. That being said, I would be interested to listen to an audiobook of this. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be, like, with the right narrator, I think it could be really good. My only concern would be there is a lot to keep track of already. Yeah, and that would be, I, when I was reading the second half of this book, I was like, I should write down all the characters' names and Mm -hmm. who they are so that I can remember between halves. It was to the point where I'm like, I need a murder board. (laughs) Yeah. I may have to do a murder board for the second half for the, the rest of the series, I should say. Just so I can keep track of who's all Yes. Where. Because, I mean, I have done that to a point. Okay, you know the TV show Yellowstone? Mm-hmm. If they kill so many people, I've started keeping track. <laughs> I think we're at 26 now. Oh my goodness. The first three seasons. They killed That's four crazy. people in the first two episodes. I thought Grey's Anatomy was bad for killing people. That's a hospital you expected. Well, but main characters, doctors... Mm-hmm. I've never watched it, so I couldn't yeah, tell no. you. But any, like, almost any character who leaves the show gets killed off. That's not entirely true. There's a few that weren't, but... Interesting. I think doctors would be better at keeping people alive. Keeping themselves alive. That too. <laughs> no. No, and it's... I kind of wonder if... I mean, depending on the narration for this book, and I, I don't even know if there's an audiobook available, frankly, I wonder if some of the transitions, like where they went from... Um, like back and forth back and forth back and forth I wonder if they had different voices or different narrators or whatever Mm -hmm. if that would be easier might be because yeah it was pretty because at one point they were I think flipping between three characters Mm -hmm. and so that when it was three when it was just two I could follow along fairly easily but when it was three I was like okay which then I'd find myself like having to go back oh I think I reread that entire section twice just yeah. by having to go back and go oh well, this is Pat now okay yep. and then oh this is Tessa okay yep. so so yeah no I mean I definitely recommend this book it's a good book mm-hmm. despite you the... probably shouldn't listen you should probably not actually listen to this podcast before you read the book because we've ruined the whole thing for you <laughs> but I mean if this gives you enough incentive to either read the book or read the rest of the series fantastic mm-hmm. uh, yeah <laughs> it's a problem with doing books like this where it's read the book that we just ruined yeah so spoiler alert yeah well, do you have any fun facts for us I do I have probably too many fun facts but I was I could have written way more (laughs) so for the fun facts today I chose to focus on the Jonestown uh, cult because there's a lot of interesting information there so just some background the People's Temple Agricultural Project better known by its informal name Jonestown was a remote settlement in Guyana is that how you would say it? Guyana Guyana established by the People's Temple a U.S. based cult under the leadership of Jim Jones Residents of Jonestown were not allowed to watch film or recorded TV without a temple staffer present to interpret the material for them. Yeah, your face. I know. (laughs) I'm sorry, but... Okay, A, cult sucks. But, on the other hand, boy, that'd be a fun job. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they were interpreting it under the guise of, like, their beliefs, right? Yes, I know. So, like, even if it was nothing political at all, they were still, like, interpreting. to interpret... I don't know, Game of Thrones or something. Trust me, you're getting some completely different out of it. So something interesting about the demographics is that African Americans made up approximately 70% of Jonestown Jonestown's population. Hmm, I did not know that. I didn't either. And 45% of the residents were black women. Hmm. So yeah, there was like a little chart and like the first one was African American and the numbers and I was like, wow, there was a lot. So I don't know... Why exactly? I but did not expect that. I mean, quite often cults have an element of racism to them. Yeah, obviously not this one. Yeah. So, yeah. Good job for not being racist, creepy cult. <laughs> so on November 18th, 1978, 
temple members were urged by Jones, Jim Jones, to commit revolutionary suicide by drinking great grape flavor aid, not Kool-Aid, which is often what people say. And that's where the phrase drink the Kool-Aid came from. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was flavor aid. I don't know. Whatever. Drink the flavor aid doesn't have the same ring. No, it really doesn't. But maybe if we'd started with saying drink the flavor aid, it would be. I don't even know that I've ever heard of flavor aid until. It sounds like discount Kool Aid. Yeah. But it was poisoned with diphenhydramine, promethazine, chlorpromazine, chloroquine, chloral hydrate, diazepam, and cyanide, which is a pretty interesting cocktail. Cocktail of drugs. Yep. And they're called death tapes, which is like a 45 minute audio recording of, which it talks about in the book, um, of the, that night. And Jones is speaking. So um, this is just a quote from there. This is a little bit. Um, Your discretion is advised. Yeah, I would say. So it says, die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down with tears and agony. I tell you, I don't care how many screams you hear. I don't care how many anguished cries. Death is a million times preferable to 10 more days of this life. If you knew what was ahead of you, if you knew what was ahead of you, you'd be glad to be stepping over tonight. That is um, interesting. To me, those words are a little chilling. Yeah. Like, Like, I don't care how many screams you hear. Death is better than this life um i don't know no yeah so like i think what was it like 909 people died that night 909 i think it was yep so and all because they followed this guy and they drank the juice like Mm -hmm. i see that is the thing where i have problems following any particular thing like it's like people that follow trump so religiously where i'm like Mm -hmm. think for yourself yeah. Do your own research. Make informed choices. Yeah. If somebody's telling you not to read something, read it. Mm-hmm. Like. Don't just blindly follow along. Mm-hmm. I hope that I have more common sense than these people and that I don't ever get, like, into a cult. <laughs> because their cults are creepy. Oh, they are. They most certainly And the are. things that they make people do. Yeah. Like, I just, yeah. It's very, it's very creepy. There was a lot more, there's a lot more information. I got all of this from Wikipedia. So, the most trusted source. <laughs> well, this, I assume most of this is fairly accurate, but uh, but yeah, there's definitely lots of info out there if that's something that interests you. Mm-hmm. Proceed with caution. Yeah. It's not for the faint of heart. No. At all. Well. <laughs> On that note. I did enjoy this book. It was it, not a cheery book, but no, I did enjoy it's it. it's not cheery, but yeah, definitely... There's enough twists and turns that if you think you know what's going to happen, you don't. You don't. Unless you listen to this podcast, then you do. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it definitely, like, held my interest. Mm-hmm. So. No, I am I am looking forward to the next ones and see how the uh, chess thing works out. Yeah. Because that's the thing. Like, Sephiron used chess. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he did was, like, each, um, each murder scene, that kind of thing was a spot on a chessboard when he figured it out geographically. Mm-hmm. But Pat figured that out. So now he can't use that again. Mm-hmm. So now what's he going to do? If he's still alive. The ambulance didn't switch him. He's <laughs> fine. I maintain he's fine. I don't know if he's fine, well, but he's probably not dead. Yeah, let's go with that. He's not dead. <laughs> he's not dead. Not fine, but not dead. <laughs> that should be a t-shirt. <laughs> 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 and on that cheery thought, we will see you next time. So that's what we thought of this book. But those are just our opinions, and we'd like to hear yours. So leave us a comment. Thanks for joining us for Between the Lines, and thanks to our editor, Linda. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.